ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so last time we finished or we talked about the topic of uh, touching the Quran and whether it's a requirement to be upon wudu or not and we mentioned the uh, two opinions on the topic uh, the opinion of the majority and then the opinion of the Zahiriya and some of the Shafi'iyya and Imam Ibn al-Mundir and others. And we said that the strongest opinion is that it's not a requirement to be upon wudu uh, and that it's recommended but it's not required. So the next thing that the author talks about is the recommendation of being upon wudu while mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he mentions a number of ahadith on this topic. The first one that he mentions is from Al-Muhajir ibn Qunfid, Qunfud from uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or that he narrates that a man passed by uh, or that he himself passed by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says, أَنَّهُ سَلَّمْ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَهُوَ يَتَوَضَّ فَلَمْ يُرُدُّ عَلَيْهِ فَلَمَّا فَرَغَ مِنْ وُضُوئِهِ قَالَ إِنَّهُ لم يمنعني أن أرد عليك إلا أني كرهت أن أذكر الله عز وجل إلا على طهارة. Uh, and then he said, and then the narrator says, قال قتادة فكان الحسن من أجل هذا يكره أن يقرأ أو يذكر الله عز وجل حتى يتطهر. Uh, or المهاجر ابن قنفض narrates that he passed by the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم while he was performing wudu. And uh, the, he made salam or he said salam to him. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't return his salam until he was finished performing wudu. And then he said, nothing prevented me from returning your salam except that I, dis- I hated to mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Allah azza wa jal while I wasn't upon tahara. And then the, he continues and says, due to this, or Qatada, rahimahullah, was from the tabi'een said, Due to this, Al-Hasan disliked or he hated to mention Allah or to recite uh, the book of Allah except if he was upon wudu. Um, and then he says, this is narrated by Ahmad, Abu Dawood, and Nasai, and Ibn Majah. So he doesn't mention any authenticity about this hadith, but it was authenticated by Imam Al-Nawawi uh, and Ibn Hajr Al-Asqalani called it Hasan. So it's an authentic hadith or it's an acceptable hadith for this topic. Then he says, or he continues, and he mentions uh, the hadith from Abu Juhayim uh, that he said, أقبل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من نحو بئر جمل فلقيه رجل فسلم عليه uh, فلم, يرد, فلم يرد عليه النبي, النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى أقبل على, على الجدار فمسح بوجهه ويديه ثم رد عليه السلام or that Abu Juhayim uh, narrates that the Prophet ﷺ came by, and or he came from Bitr Jamal, so meaning he wasn't upon wudu at this state or in this situation. So then the Prophet, this man, said salam to him. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't reply this or re- return the salam until he went to a to a wall and he touched it and then he wiped his face and his hands and then he returned uh, the salam to him. Um, and this is narrated, he says, narrated by Ahmed al-Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, and Nas- Nasai. So here it's obviously an authentic hadith. So we see from this a number of things. First of all, that the Prophet ﷺ preferred to uh, only mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name or any sort of uh, dhikr when he was upon wudu or when he was upon tahara. We also see from this that in, if the person is in this situation and they don't have uh, the time to perform wudu that it's perfor- it's permissible to perform tayammum in this situation until they find water. Also, we see that uh, the permissibility of uh, performing tayammum from anything that's from the ground, because obviously the time in that time the the homes were made or the walls were made from clay, and clay comes from the ground. So this shows that it's permissible to use anything from the ground to perform wudu or to perform tayammum. So then, the, then the author says. This action was one of preference, not obligation. So meaning that it's not obligatory to be upon wudu if you mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name, but it's recommended. And then he says, mentioning the name of Allah is permissible for the one who is in a state of purity, one who has a minor impurity, so meaning he's not upon wudu, and a person 
who is in uh, Janaba, as well as one who is standing and sitting and so on. And then he, he mentions the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha that we talked about many times before, that she said, كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ أَحْيَانِهِ Or that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to mention Allah uh, in any situation that he was in. Um, and then he says, uh, narrated by uh, the five except the Nasa'i, so meaning Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, at Tirmidhi, and Ahmad. And then he says Al Bukhari recorded it in Mu'allaq form. So who remembers what Mu'allaq is? Mentioned it lots of times. Mu'allaq form, we talked about it. You guys need to remember this. It's without the Isnad. Why do they call it that? No, but where does that come from? The Mu'allaq, where does that? Why do they call it that? What does mu'allaq mean? Literally, like, literally translated. Stop. Or hanging. It's hanging. So it's like, it's, it's like if it's something was hanging from the ceiling, the bottom part of it's missing. So it's mu'allaq. So the bottom, the chain is missing from it. So only, he only mentioned that this, the narration. There's no, he didn't mention what the chain was. So it's as if something's up there, like the hadith, and the, the chain to get to it is missing. So it's like it's hanging from something. So that's what mu'allaq is. So the author says Al-Bukhari only narrated it as Mu'allaq, but it's actually also narrated by uh, Muslim as well. So it's an authentic hadith, and even Imam Al-Bukhari authenticated it elsewhere. So he didn't put it in his Sahih with a chain, but elsewhere he uh, declared it to be an authentic hadith. And that was, like we talked about before, Imam Al-Tirmidhi was from one of Imam Al-Bukhari's main students, and he asked him about this hadith, and he said that it's an authentic hadith. So this is... Uh, authentic from Aisha that she said that the Prophet ﷺ would mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any of his situations. Then uh, he mentions a hadith uh, from Ali radiallahu anhu that he said, uh, or he is talking about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, وَلَا يَحْجُبُهُ عَنِ الْقُرْآنِ شَيْءٌ لَيْسَ جَنَابًا or Laysa al Janaba, or that the Prophet ﷺ, nothing would prevent him from the Qur'an except for Janaba. So meaning that he would recite the Qur'an in any situation unless he was upon Janaba. Um, so he mentions this and then he says that Tirmidhi ibn as second called it Sahih. So meaning it's, he's, he considers this authentic. But um, it's actually a weak hadith. So uh, many of the ulama talked about this and said that it's not authentic from the Prophet ﷺ that he wouldn't recite Qur'an while he was upon Janaba. So all we have from this is from Aisha radiallahu anha saying he would mention Allah in any situation. So this is just a very short uh, section on talking about the recommendation of being upon tahara. The next section that he talks about is when going to sleep. So the ruling on being upon wulu when one goes to sleep. So for this he mentions a number of ahadith. The first one that he starts with is from Al-Bara' ibn Azib radiallahu anhu. That he said, قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا أَتَيْتَ مَضْجَعَكَ فَتَوَضَّ وُضُوَكَ لِلصَّلَاةِ ثم اضطجع على شقك الأيمن ثم قل اللهم أسلمت وجهي إليك وفوضت أمري إليك وألجأت ظهري إليك رغبة ورهبة أو رغبة ورهبة إليك or that البراء بن عازب narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said if you go to if you are going to uh, go to sleep then perform your wudu the same way that you do for the salat and then say the meaning of which translates as O Allah I submit my soul to you and I turn my face to you and I entrust my affairs to you and I retreat to you for protection. Um, and then he continues, لا ملجأ ولا منجا منك إلا إليك اللهم آمنت بكتابك الذي أنزلت وبنبيك الذي أرسلت فإن مت من ليلتك فأنت على الفطرة وجعلهن آخر or that then the Prophet ﷺ continued, the meaning of which is, There is no resort and no savior but you. I affirm my faith in your books, which you revealed, and in your prophet, which you sent. And if you die during the night, or in during that night of yours, then you will be upon the fitrah. And then he said, and make that your last words of the night. And then the author continues, or the, he mentions, uh, 
that he said, قال فردتها على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فلما بلغت اللهم آمنت بكتابك الذي أنزلت قلت ورسولك قال لا ونبيك الذي أرسلت and that the, he continues the, the Sahabi saying that he repeated this dua to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and then when he got to the part where it says and in the book that you uh, revealed and in the, the Prophet that you sent, the Sahabi said, in the Messenger that you sent. So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, in the Prophet that you sent. So meaning, he corrected him when the, when the Sahabi al-Bara uh, put the word uh, Rasul in place of the word Nabi. He said, no, wa bi nabiyik alladhi arsalt. So he corrected him on this. So we take from this a number of things. First of all, that at the very least it's recommended to be upon wudu when you're going to bed and to say this dua. And you can also take from it that the prophets are also sent, not just messengers. So we know that there's this idea that, uh, and we talked about this before in the Aqeedah lessons, that there's this idea that the, uh, a prophet is someone who receives revelation, but they're not told to go tell it to the people, and that the messengers are the ones who receive revelation and they have to go out and tell people. But we see from this that this is incorrect because the Prophet ﷺ said, "Wabi nabiyik alladhi or the, with the Prophet that you sent." So he sent the prophets just as he sent the messengers. And you also see the the rule that when it comes to dhikr or a specific du'a that the Prophet ﷺ taught, it can't be changed into something that takes the same meaning. So if the Prophet ﷺ taught us the tashahud a certain way, we can't. You know, change it a little bit and say, well, it's generally the same meaning, it's fine to say that way. Or if the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say certain things uh, in, those, in the sujood or in the rukur or after standing up from rukur, we can't say, well, we're going to generally give it the same meaning and, you know, you can change it a little bit or you can change the order of the way that the Prophet ﷺ said certain things because here the Prophet ﷺ corrected him, even though we know... he. If there's two words that are going to be closer in meaning, it's Nabi and Rasul. But here he even told him, no, it can't be, it has to be the way that he taught him it. So uh, he mentions this hadith, and this is it's narrated by Ahmad and Al-Bukhari and At-Tirmidhi. So here, uh, just to keep in mind that the point here is that when you get into bed, you're upon wudu. If you get into bed and immediately nullify your wudu, you don't have to go back and, nullif- and make wudu again in order to fulfill this hadith. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, when you go to bed, make like to be upon wudu, or perform wudu when you're going into bed. So if you do that, it doesn't mean you have to fall asleep while you're upon wudu. You just have, when you get into bed, be upon wudu to fall under this hadith. Um, and that was mentioned by Nawawi and the Safarini and others. So they said that this hadith doesn't mean that you have to stay upon wudu uh, until you fall asleep. It's as long as you get into your bed while you're upon uh, wudu. Um, and there's other ahadith on the topic that talk about the virtues or the fala'il of being upon wudu when you go to sleep, but they're all weak. So all we have that tells us about being upon wudu is that we should do it. And if we do it and make this dua and then we die that night, then you'll die upon the fitrah. Then the author continues and he says, this also applies to janaba. So meaning that if someone's upon janaba and they want to sleep, they should perform wudu. So then he says, uh, uh, or he mentions here that Ibn Umar asked the Prophet ﷺ, but it should be Umar, it's not from, it's not from uh, Ibn Umar. So Umar asked the Prophet ﷺ, or Stafta Umar, and Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أَيَنَامُ أَحَدُنَا وَهُوَ جُنُبْ قَالَ نَعَمْ إِذَا تَوَضَّى Or that Umar asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if one of us can sleep, or are we allowed to sleep when we're upon janaba? And he said yes, if he performs wudu. Um, and this hadith, he didn't mention where it is, but it's narrated by uh, Al-Bukhari and by Imam Muslim as well. So it's an authentic hadith. And then he says, uh, Aisha narrated, or كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أراد أن ينام وهو جنب غسل فرجه وتوضأ للصلاة. Or that uh, Aisha narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, if he was upon Janaba and he wanted to sleep, he would wash his private areas and then he would perform his wudu for the Salat. So meaning that it was the same as the, his wudu for the Salat. And he says related by the group. So that's authentic. It includes Al-Bukhari and, and Muslim as well. So just to talk a bit about this, 
which Allah, which is the performing or being upon wudu or performing wudu if you want to sleep while you're upon janaba. So there's four opinions or approximately four opinions. Yeah. But the, what is the, there's, and the, the other hadiths is they complete that saying you wash like every single part of your body has to touch water, right? For ghusl, right? For ghusl. So this means like if you're upon janab and you just want to sleep, what's that? But it said he was upon janab and he just washed his privates and he made wudu. To go sleep. Oh. Oh, like meaning he performed, the wudu he did was the same as he does for the salat. Right, he said wudu to make salat. Well, it says his wudu for the salat. So meaning like, just so Aisha was clarifying that the wudu he would do here is the same he would do when, it's, when he wanted to pray. So, so he would do it the same manner. When you wake up, you start to make wudu. For sure, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so the first opinion about performing wudu to sleep if you're upon janaba is that it's obligatory. So meaning that it would be haram to go to sleep if you're upon janaba unless you performed wudu. Um, and that's the opinion of the lahiriyyah as well as uh, Ibn Habib, who was from the, one of the main imams of the Maliki Madhab. So the evidence that they used to say it's obligatory is they used the hadith where Umar radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu can one of us sleep? So what did he say? If he, yes, if he performs wudu. So the understanding from that is, if he doesn't perform wudu, then no, you can't. So he said, he gave him the permission with the condition that he would perform uh, wudu before, uh, before sleeping. Um, and then also they say that Aisha radiallahu anha when she said كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أراد أن ينام so when she says he used to do this it gives the understanding that he would always do this so he would never go to sleep upon janaba without making wudu so if we have the, uh, the reply to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu plus this hadith they say this is sufficient to show that it's obligatory um, meaning that if a, the person would be sinful if they didn't uh, if they didn't do so, the other opinions really the, the other three opinions they all they all indicate that it's recommended. So some say it's mustahab or mandub to be upon wudu or to perform wudu if you're upon janab. But others say it's makruh to sleep unless you perform wudu. So really in the end it's this, it's it's very similar in the ruling. So meaning that, that you should do it, but if you don't do it. It's not obligatory. Um, so the rest take this opinion. So the uh, Ahnaf and the Hanabila and the Shafi'iyya and the majority of the Malikiya say that it's the person should do so. If they go to sleep upon Janaba without making wudu, they're not sinful. But, uh, then, but the person um, would have lost out on a reward. Um, the evidence is... How did they base their opinion about that he's sinful or he's not sinful? Because the hadith doesn't say, doesn't say it's simple, uh, simple. No, but Omar he asked him, "Can we do this?" Mm. He said no. He said no. Illa the tawadda or naam ida tawadda. So if he sleeps without making wudu, then he's, uh, that means it makes him simple. In this, in this, according in to this. The, these ones, because they say when he said, "Are we allowed to do this?" He didn't say yes. He said yes if he makes wudu. So the only, yani it's only allowed if you make the wudu. Others, like, why are they saying that they're not sinful? If, if, you do that, if you don't do that. They have some hadith that we'll talk about. Okay. So the first one that they mention is hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha that she said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ينام وهو جنب من غير أن يمس ماء or that uh, Aisha radiallahu anha said the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to uh, sleep while he was upon Janaba without touching any water. So meaning he wouldn't make ghusl and he wouldn't perform wudu. He would just sleep without having touched any water. Um, and this hadith is narrated by, uh, by Abu Dawood um, and, and others as well. Um, but this hadith, uh, it's a defective hadith. So there's the, the, if, if we look at this, the, this hadith, really it's the same hadith as the other one. Even though uh, as it's the same hadith as Aisha radiallahu anha when she said that the, the Prophet ﷺ would make wudu or would sleep upon janaba if he washed his private area and made wudu. But if, if we follow, like, and it's not, it's not a hadith course so we won't go into it too much, but if we follow the chains of narration of this hadith, you can see that at some point some of the narrators made a mistake. So what does that mean? If we have Aisha radiallahu anha here narrating the hadith, 
Then under we have the tabi'in taking the hadith from her. And then later on we have uh, the other, you know, the atba' tabi'in taking the hadith. At one of these levels in the chain, a split happened where the authentic chain kept narrating it the same way that we said. That the Prophet ﷺ would sleep upon Janab if he washed his private area and made wudu. The weak chain started narrating it as he would, make, he would sleep without touching any water. So it's the same hadith if you follow the chains back to the Ta'aisha radiallahu anha, but at one point in one of the levels of the, of the chains of narration, uh, a split happened and some of the weak narrators started saying it the opposite way. So saying that he would sleep without touching any water. So the ones who say that it's not obligatory, they say, well, we have this hadith from Aisha saying that he would, the Prophet ﷺ would sleep when, without touching any water. So this shows that it's allowed because if the Prophet ﷺ did it, then we obviously... It would, especially if he did it on a, on a continual basis, obviously it would be allowed. But this becomes, you know, it shows us the importance of not just picking up any book of hadith and saying, this, we're going to apply this hadith, we're going to apply this hadith. You have to know the authenticity of the hadith and, and are there mistakes in it or something like this before you apply it. So this one, really, the hadith is unusable because, first of all, it's weak, plus the actual narration is the one that sh- shows that it's obligatory. And then also, the, or the last thing that they use is they say that Umar radiallahu anhu said, they mention the same hadith again. Umar radiallahu anhu uh, asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أَيَنَامُ أَحَدُنَا وَهُوَ جُنُبْ فَقَالَ نَعَمْ وَيَتَوَضَّ إِنْ شَاءَ Or that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by Umar, can one of us sleep while he's upon Janaba? And he said, yes, and let him make wudu if he wants to. So, the, in this, so this hadith, uh, it's narrated by uh, Ibn Khuzayma as well. But again, this is another um, uh, example of the same type of thing where, the, where there's a mistake in the hadith. So we have Umar radiallahu anhu narrating a hadith, passing it on to the tabi'een, passing it on down, down, down the chain. At one point, one chain, one part of the chain kept narrating it. The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, if he makes wudu. Another, at one part in the chain, someone added on the words, if he wishes, or if he wants. So, these ones kept narrating it as showing that it's obligatory, because you can't sleep unless you make wudu. Someone, one of the weak narrators, added the words, or mistakenly added the words, if he wants. So we see here that that's a huge difference, because one shows you'd have to do it, and the other one shows it's up to you if you want to do it. And same thing with the hadith of Aisha. So this is, again, another example of the importance of looking into the authenticity of hadith before you pass them on, before you tell them to people, before you use them to judge if something's halal or haram or uh, wajib or mustahab or anything like this. We have to know the authenticity before we pass things on like this because obviously we see here that uh, the same hadith, because of a few words that were mistakenly narrated in the hadith, it changes the whole meaning of the hadith to, the, to a complete other ruling. So if we look at this, we can see that the Prophet ﷺ would never sleep upon Janaba unless he made wudu. And he would tell the people they can sleep if they make wudu. And we don't have anything that shows that it's uh, allowed or shows that the Prophet ﷺ slept upon Janaba unless he made wudu or gave permission to anyone to sleep when they weren't upon wudu. So Allahu Alam, if, if we look at all this, the first opinion would be definitely stronger because the Prophet ﷺ only gave permission to sleep in that situation if they were upon wudu, otherwise they couldn't. Yeah. Is there a certain word when like uh, when the hadith gets like, like it goes off to like or there's a fabrication in it? Or we're just if, a fabrication. No, fa- fa- fabrication we would only say if we know that it's actually made up on the Prophet like uh, intentionally, or that it's intentionally, so then we would call it mawdur, or like which fabricated. But in this situation, uh, the earlier scholars would call it munkar, and the later ones would call it shav. So meaning that so- someone contradicted someone else who was stronger than them. Because, you know, like just like now, if, if, if I tell you something and he, you tell Ali something and Ali tells Jamal something, and then... The same thing, Hassan hears the same thing as you hear, but then Khalid hears, you know, he passes it on to, to someone else different than Ali did. Then we're going to look and say, well, it's the same incident. You know, everyone was at the same thing, but they're saying two different things about the incident. So we have to judge, well, is this one, off, is this one correct or is this one correct? So then you'd say, well, you know, uh, you know for example, like... 
does he always like exactly like would you say like is he known for all like he always gets things wrong because you know there's people who anytime they tell you a story you're like yeah, i don't know if that's even true because he probably messed it up or he didn't hear it right or he saw it wrong or something like that so you'd compare it to who the other person is so same thing with a hadith like you know, the ulama of the earlier ulama of hadith would you know have thousands and thousands of chains of narration and they would review them and see did this person contradict someone else who who narrated it this way and who narrated it this way were these people not more in numbers were they have stronger memory would they write things down better were they with that sheikh for a longer time that they could hear things so they would take all these things into consideration and um that's kind of uh it's it's and it's a really large topic when it comes to hadith like because there's you know, thousands of a hadith where there's words changed or things added or things taken out. So it's it's a very it's a very precise science, but it's also really really important too. So um, uh, this is uh, inshallah we'll stop there with uh, regards to the um, to, to the dars today, and then if there's any questions, we'll answer those. Next week we'll uh, talk about uh, the the author goes in to remove janaba, so meaning that. If a person is upon janabah and they want to uh, um, have intercourse again or they want to eat and drink or drink, that it's recommended or obligatory to perform wudu. Um, so inshallah we'll go into that uh, part of the book next time. Allahu